Question. How are we doing this morning? How many of you guys believe the Bible is an exciting book? Thank you. So, I want you to answer me this question. How many of you guys, with the exception of a day where you happen to be fasting, you ate food every single day without exception of 2013? Unless you were fasting, you ate food every single day of 2013. Raise them high, eaters. Okay. Okay. How many of you guys in 2013 read your Bible every single day without fail, without exception in 2013? In both services, we had one. Here's another question. What's more important, your belly or the Bible? I know you know what you're supposed to say. I'm supposed to say Bible. Of course the Bible is more important to me than my belly. But isn't it interesting that you and I will eat every single day without fail, without exception, and yet there are days we can go without eating the Word of God, reading the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying this this morning in order to shame you or to guilt trip you. The reason I'm pointing this out is because hopefully your heart will cry out, there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with the fact that perhaps for many Christians, we don't read our Bibles on a regular basis. In a lot of way, research, it found that 90% of churchgoers agree with the statement I desire to please and honor Jesus in all that I do 90% of churchgoers said that they agree with that statement but only 19% read the Bible every day and about 25% read the Bible a few times a week 14% say they read the Bible once a week 22% say that they read the Bible once a month or a few times a month. And then here's a scary one. 18% of these Christians said that they rarely or never read their Bibles. I think that the church needs more God-honoring, Christ-loving, Bible-soaked people. And those statistics kind of scare me. And they're probably a little bit more more worse than what they say. That probably less people read their Bible on a regular basis than should. And I am often reminded of this quote by Charles Spurgeon, where he said, "Is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord so that your blood is bibline and the very essence of the Bible flows from you. What if we had those kind of people in our church where the very essence of the Bible flowed from us and our blood was bibline? So again, my goal this morning is not to try and guilt trip you or shame you. I have a much higher goal than that because oftentimes when somebody tries to guilt trip you or make you feel bad about something, it doesn't last very long. As soon as you get out of the presence of that person, you stop doing whatever they told you to do. This morning, what my desire is, my goal is that you would desire to read the word of God daily without fail. Desire. Not just, let me just check this off. Let me just do it because the pastor says, but there'll be a deep desire in your heart to do that. So for us to do that, I want to answer three questions this morning. The first question is going to be, why should we read our Bibles? Why should we read our Bibles? And then the second question is, what keeps us from reading them? What keeps us from reading them? And then third, what are some suggestions to help us read more? So we're going to take those one at a time. And there'll be a lot of scriptures this morning. And um, I want you to sort of Relax a little bit because I'll be going through them kind of fast. So if you want notes, I'll have notes prepared for you that have all the uh, scriptures for you. So you don't have to scramble and and scurry too much. Um, So for the scriptures that that we'll be talking about this morning, if you want notes, we can have those for you. So first question, why should we read our Bibles? Now, 
It's unfortunate that many people re um, think about the Bible the same way we think about a textbook or the newspaper. When you, when you go to a newspaper or you go to a textbook, why are you going to a newspaper and why are you going to a textbook? You're going to those things because you want information. So you go to a newspaper because they tell you in a newspaper um, who won the game yesterday. What are the stocks at? Um, wh what happened in the shooting that happened yesterday? You go there for just information. But you don't go to a textbook. You don't go to a newspaper in order to have a relationship with the person who wrote it. All you're going to that book or that newspaper for is to get information. And the Bible is much more than a textbook. And it's much more than just a hub of information. The Bible is God's word. The Bible is the word of God. Another way to say it is what the Bible says, God says. Another way to say it is the Bible is God speaking directly to us. Now, that leads us to the first reason why we should read our Bibles. Number one, the reason we should read our Bibles is because God speaks to us. First reason is because God speaks to us. Now, I don't think this lands on us as hard as it should because many of us have been in church long enough to know that we've heard that. The Bible is God speaking to us. The Bible is God's word to us. And we, we all know that. But I don't think it lands on us as hard as it should. I remember growing up as a young Christian, I was very interested in wanting to know more of God and have more of God. And I was kind of hanging around a group of people who seemed to always have God talking to them. They were always saying, yeah, I was walking down the street and God told me to pick something up and there was a hundred dollars underneath it. And I'm sitting there like, I, well, God never says anything to me like that. And so I was reading all these books. I was watching these people trying to figure out how can I get God to speak to me? And so I read somewhere, one of the guys said, what you need to do is you need to go into your room, you need to go into a closet and you just need to be quiet before the Lord and just ask him to speak to you. Just say, Lord, speak to me. And so I went into the closet, I closed the door and I sat in a the closet. There was clothes hit me in the face, but I was just like, Lord, I'm here to meet with you, here to hear you. That will make you crazy. To sit in a closet and to listen and try to hear something. Let me tell you, I'm silly enough. And when I'm quiet, the kind of things that were coming to my head. Yeah. Candy cane icicles. Lord, was that you? Did you say something about candy cane icicles? Do you want me to? Raspberry cheesecake. All these weird thoughts, all these weird ideas started coming to me, and I got frustrated. And I started to hear things like, go to Africa. <laughs> I said, no, I, no I, don't, I don't want to go to Africa. Because I was trying to hear God speak to me, thinking that I had to go into a room, I have to be quiet, I have to listen. Apparently, God couldn't speak over noise, so I had to be in a room that was quiet, because God, if there's noise in the room, he obviously he can't speak to you so I had to be really really quiet and I just got frustrated and I just stopped until you run into the scriptures that teach very clearly that God speaks to us through his word now in a, again I want this to land on this hard like it should because I think sometimes we talk certain things we say certain things because we know it's right but I don't know if we really truly believe God speaks to us in this book now, it was interesting, Jesus was talking to the Sadducees, and the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. And so they were posing this question to him to try and trip him up. And so the question they asked is, well, if there's a woman and she marries a man, and then the man dies, and then she marries that man's brother, and then he dies, and then she marries the next brother, and then the next brother, all the way up to number seven, in the resurrection, whose husband would she be? So they're trying to give, you know, trying to trip him up to see what he would say. And it's interesting what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29 all the way to verse 33. Jesus replied, he said this, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. 
I want you to notice how Jesus says we should read our Bibles. Notice, go back up and look what he says. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? Now, if you know where Jesus is quoting from, he's quoting from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where God is talking to Moses. He's not talking to Sadducees. So Jesus says to these group of Sadducees, have you not read what God says to you? So the way Jesus wants us to read our Bibles is he wants us to be able to say that as we read our Bibles, we can take it as God directly addressing us. In other words, you can say the Bible has your name on it. The Bible is God speaking to you, even though it is not essentially about you. Now, the way we are to look at Scripture is to see it as to us, and we are to understand what God is saying to us, but it's only when it is properly interpreted. Because sometimes people will take the Bible and they will say things like, well, I opened up the Bible and this is what the Bible means to me. It is irrelevant what the Bible means to you. The question is, what does the Bible mean? And then once you figure out what the Bible means, then you can ask, what does it mean to me? So Jesus is saying, one way to read your Bible is to look at it as a personal address. One person said it's a present tense personal address. And so when properly understood, the Bible we can see as God speaking to us. You can say it this way. Our reading is God speaking. Say that with me. Our reading is God speaking. So every time you and I pick up this book and reread it, it is God speaking. And there are ways that God speaks to us outside of Scripture. It talks about him speaking through the works of of his people but understand those works and those other ways that God communicates have no basis outside the scripture so they don't have any power they don't have any leeway outside of the Bible so they get we know God speaks in those ways because of the Bible so even if we look at someone who is doing good deeds and some say oh God spoke to me through this deed remember it's because that's what the Bible says so God speaks to us as we read his word number two why should we read our Bibles? Number two, because it's how we see the glory of God. It's how we see the glory of God. Glory is a kind of difficult word to nail down. But the word glory, in the Hebrew, it means the splendor or the majesty of God. And it also refers to an expression of God's character. The word literally means to be heavy or weighty. And so the idea would be of if somebody was had a, a weighty or heavy type of reputation, it'd be somebody who had power, someone who had prestige, someone who had a position. And that is the idea of someone who has glory. And another word that the Old Testament uses is the word Shekinah glory. And that word means the dwelling glory. And you see that with uh, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud where God comes and he dwells in a certain uh, physical way. Now, the question is, when we talk about seeing the glory of God, what are we talking about? You and I were created for the glory of God. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 6, he says this, Do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who was called by my name, whom I created for my glory. And then in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31, Paul says, So whether you eat or or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So, everything in the universe, everything in the universe exists for the glory of God. And God's desire for you and for me is that we see his glory. Now, you know how I know that is because Jesus prays that we would see his glory. In John 17, in verse 24, he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. 
the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. So the question this morning is how does that happen? And we tend to think that seeing glory means seeing it with your eyes. But in the Bible, it's, it, it's much different. And we're going to go to two, two passages to see this. And I want you to actually turn here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible this morning, we do put it up there for you so you don't have to worry about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and starting in verse 3. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and starting at verse 3. I ask you to put on your thinking caps because it's, it's, once you get it, it's really good. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God? For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Satan wants to keep people from being saved. Satan wants to keep people from salvation. And what is the way he does it? He does not do it by keeping people from going to church. A lot of non-Christians are in church, and Satan has no issue with that. Because just because you're in church doesn't mean you're a Christian. Doesn't mean that you'll understand. He has an even deeper strategy. And this passage said, the God of this age, which is Satan... He says that he blinds the minds of unbelievers so they can't see something very specific. And what is it that they cannot see? They cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. And later on, he says that he blinds them also from the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So what happens when somebody gets saved? When somebody gets saved, God shines his light into our hearts and gives us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So as we see Jesus, we see the glory of God. And the way we get the glory of God is through, he says, through knowledge, which is what Satan blinds people from seeing. God, uh, Satan wants to keep people from seeing glory because when you see glory, you're changed. And I want you to see this because the... The way you and I see glory is through the word of God, through the message of the gospel. And this is all throughout scripture. I want you to turn with me to Exodus 33. Because this is again where you see this idea of the glory of God being seen through the word of God. Exodus 33, and starting in verse 18. Exodus 33, and starting in verse 18. For time's sake, I'm just going to start reading. Moses says this, Moses said, now show me your glory. Have you ever prayed, God, show me your glory? Moses did. And this is what his response was. Verse 19. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Skip to chapter 34 and verse 5. God gives Moses these instructions about making the tablets for the Ten Commandments. And then in verse 5, this is, again, what Moses said, I want to see your glory. Then... Verse 5, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. I want you to notice, Moses says, I want to see your glory. And what does God do? He proclaims 
his name. Look what he says. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. Verse 8, Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. Show me your glory. Now, we cannot see God unveiled in all of his splendor because it would kill us. So God says, I'm going to show you who I am. But the way he does it is he says, I am going to reveal my glory to you by me proclaiming the essence of who I am. And when he does that, Moses sees glory and he worships. And so this means for you. And for me, that when we're talking about the glory of God, the principle is this. Hearing leads to seeing. Hearing leads to seeing. The word of God leads us to see the glory of God. God responded to Moses' request to see his glory by saying, I'm going to proclaim who I am. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 21, it says this, The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word through his word and there's coming a day where we'll see God's glory on full display but today God reveals himself as we hear the gospel if you listen to what God said as he revealed himself to Moses the Lord compassionate gracious abounding in love and all that stuff doesn't that sound like the gospel doesn't that sound like what we preach day in and day out to people? God is loving. God is compassionate. He forgives sin. That is the gospel. One person said it's his gospel presence. That when we see glory, we are seeing the gospel. And that goes back to what Paul was saying. He blinds people from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ. And so the point here is hearing leads to seeing. You guys know this scripture in ten, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from what? Hearing the message, and the message is heard through what? The word of Christ. So faith is what happens when the glory of God is seen. When you see God's glory, it produces faith in your heart, and you believe. This is exactly what salvation is. Salvation happens when you and I see glory. That's why you're saved, because you saw glory. And that's what, when we read the word of God, you and I are seeing glory. Now notice, the Bible doesn't talk about hearing glory. You notice that? It doesn't say hear the glory of God. It says see. So you know what that means? Hearing is the means and seeing is the goal. The goal is that you and I would see the glory of God. But how do we get there? We get there through hearing. So this morning, as you hear the gospel preached, as we sing songs about the gospel and about the glory of God, we are, we are proclaiming the gospel, and through that you see the glory of God. You don't hear it. You see it. And so the aim of all our hearing of God's truth is the seeing of God's glory. That is the aim of hearing truth, that you see glory. And so why do we read our Bibles? You and I, we want to see glory. Like Moses, I want to see your glory. And how do you get it? Through the word. Now, what happens is if you, if you stop there, if you stop with just, I just want to see glory, you will miss the whole point of the scripture because Jonathan Edwards, who was a very famous theologian, said this, that God is glorified not in just his glory being seen, but in his glory being rejoiced in. God is glorified not just in his glory being seen, but in his glory being rejoiced in. This is normal. When somebody brings in a new baby, what does everybody do? pick him up and bothering everybody through church let me, let, me, let me get him because you are rejoicing over that when somebody gets a new car what do you do oh, let me get a ride you be all up on them because you want to rejoice with them it's normal and I want to do a little experiment I want you I'm going to tell you some news and I don't want you to react at all to what you hear don't, don't smile don't clap don't do anything okay now I have to throw this out this, what I'm about to tell you is not true so do not freak out okay <laughs> All right. <laughs> Went to the doctor. Mm -mm. <laughs> Went to the doctor, and the doctor told me I had a disease that would kill me in two months. And I was really, really scared because you know I have a wife, 
ministry, and I was just really, really scared about that. So I went to a service, and at this service, God, he healed me. I mean, he, he, he touched me, and I am healed. Guys, I'm healed. God healed me. I'm, I'm going to be here. You guys are like, <laughs> isn't that weird? To not rejoice with somebody who is saying, I've been healed. Let's try it again. Now you can respond. God healed me. See? That's normal. Now, this is what we do. We come to church. He saved us by his blood. How many tiles are on the ceiling? I mean, how are you bored in church? God... Because of who he is, it is impossible for him to be boring. So if, if you come to church and you fall asleep, I listen, I see everything. I see some of y'all. Amen. 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 <laughs> I know it's warm in here. You, you know, all that stuff that goes on. You know, I've fallen asleep before in church, so it's okay. But. When you and I see glory, it's not boring. And God is glorified not just when you say, oh, yeah, I saw his glory. It was cool. It was all right. When you and I see glory, it should lead us to rejoice in his glory. Because God is glorified not just in us seeing his glory, but in his glory being rejoiced in. It leads me to number three. Why read our Bibles? Because it produces joy. Did you know God wants you to be happy? Some people think God wants us to be, you know, sad and jury and walking around and depressed all the time. God is, is for your joy. We should be the happiest people on earth. The happiest place on earth should not be Disneyland. <laughs> it should be the church. People, you, know, you see, man, we see kids going into Disneyland. They <laughs> when we come to church, people should say, oh, my goodness, these people are ridiculous. What is, what is going on? Because... When we read the scriptures, it is for our joy. Let me ask you this question. What would make you more happy? What would make you more happy? To receive a $100,000 raise or to read through the Bible in one year? I know some of you guys are saying, man, you know all the things I could do for the glory of God with $100,000? <laughs> Seriously, what would make you more happy? Reading through the word or I get a hundred thousand dollar raise. And I know you try you know, you're trying to be churchy right now. Oh yeah, the word. <laughs> Jesus, hallelujah, yeah, whatever. If you get that real opportunity, what will make you more happy? Now look, what might make you more happy in reality, what should make you more happy, and listen, what will make you more happy is reading through the Bible in one year. Because God has given us his word, listen, for our joy. Yes. And here's the thing. We've been brainwashed into thinking that money is what brings happiness. Some of the most, most miserable people in the world are, have billions of dollars. And some of the happiest people in the world have nothing. You, uh, if you've ever been to Africa, these kids are just happy. Yes. Playing with a stick. Yes. Just a stick. <laughs> And they're happy. And we have been just so brainwashed into thinking that it's all about having stuff and, and getting things. And those are things that are going to produce joy in our life. One of my greatest, most fun pastimes is watching late night um, religious television. <laughs> and it's one of those things that gets my blood pressure going up. Because there are people on there who, Lord forgive me, are idiots. I saw one guy, he was talking about sowing a thousand dollar seed into my ministry and you know, and so he's preaching and he's talking about, you know, I have, I had already had like five Maseratis and somebody came and said, I'll give you another one. He said, I don't need one. He said, but I want to give you one. He said, what color do you want? He's like, well, if I had to, I'd get it black. And he said, and he gave me a black one. And he said, I paid for a jet cash. And he just started, he's just going on and on about all the stuff he has. And the people in the crowd are kind of like. And he says, see, all these jealous people here in the crowd. He said, act like you're happy about somebody's blessing. I almost threw 
the remote through the control through the TV. Here is somebody who's t telling you the key to happiness in Christian life is having stuff. Watch that stuff. They don't talk at all about the glory of God. It's all more stuff. It's all healing. It's all I got to check. I got to check. And listen, God does all those things, but those things are not ultimate. And that's what they build their ministry on. And God has given us himself. He's given us his word for our joy. It produces joy when you and I read the word of God. And how interesting is it that the very thing God has given to us for our joy, we often toss it aside. When we're sad, when we're depressed, when things aren't going our way, I'm not going to read the Bible. And God is saying, this is the very thing I've given to you for your joy. Don't neglect it. Some scriptures just to, to so you can see this is what God has given us his word for. Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. He says, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. Psalm 119 verse 162. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. Psalm 119 verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Job 23 and verse 12 says, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Honestly, when you read the scriptures, does that bring you joy? I want you to listen to George Mueller as he writes. He was a great man of God. You should read his biography. Um, the things God did through this guy was ridiculous. And I want you to hear just what he says about his own time of reading. He says, now I would give a few hints to my younger fellow believers as to the way in which, in which to keep up spiritual enjoyment. It is absolutely needful. We should read regularly through the scriptures consecutive to, consecutively and not pick out here and there a chapter. If we do, we remain spiritual dwarfs. I tell you so affectionately. For the first four years after my conversion, I made no progress because I neglected the Bible. But when I regularly read on through the whole with reference to my own heart and soul, I directly made progress. Then my peace and joy continued more and more. Now I have been doing this for 47 years. I have read through the whole Bible about a hundred times, and I always find it fresh when I begin again. Thus my peace and joy have increased all the more. 47 years, and he says, my peace and my joy has increased all the more. Number four, it's the key to answered prayer. Reading the words of key to answered prayer, John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. What is the difference between a, a non-Christian's prayer and a Christian's prayer? Well, oftentimes, there's nothing different. Because oftentimes, the very things that non-believers want are the same things that Christians are after. You know what Jesus says? Don't run after the things like the pagans. Because they're very concerned about all those things. When you have the Word of God, when you've been reading the Word of God and meditating on the Word of God, you begin to think God's thoughts after Him. And you begin to pray differently. You start to pray for His glory and His renown. And so, you, you, you can't always tell the difference between a, a, a Christian's prayer and a non-Christian's prayer because oftentimes a Christian, we are all about our own interests. And when we come to God in prayer, sometimes we want Him to be so devoted to our interests, and we're not at all devoted to his interests. The, the power of prayer is being totally committed to God's purposes. Because when that happens, when that happens, your needs get met too. And the way that happens is through reading the, the Bible. Our prayers need to be shaped by his goals, his heart, and his purposes. Number five, the word warns us. In Psalm 19, in verses 7 through 11, we won't read all of it, but toward the end, he says, By them, the scriptures, let's go back up, the, ordin the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Then he says this, But 
By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. Isn't it true that a lot of the things you and I deal with, we deal with because we did not heed the warnings of Scripture? If you had just listened to what the Bible said, you would not have been in the predicament that you're in right now. Just listen to what the Word says. There are so many people who did not listen to God's command to flee sexual immorality. People who have not listened to God's command about not to be mastered by anything. Who are now dealing with lung cancer because they didn't listen to what God said about not letting things to, to um, dominate your body. And on and on and on. If you just listen to what God says, you would be, be free of a lot of the problems that you're dealing with now. Amen. You will be saved from a thousand heartaches wow. if you would just listen to the warnings of Scripture. Okay, we'll move on. Number six, the word creates and sustains life. It creates and sustains life. Peter says in chapter 1, verse 23 of his book, 1 Peter, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. How are you saved? How does, was life created in you? Through the word of God. But then how is life sustained? Same thing, word of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, where Jesus is talking to the, the devil. He said, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Real living, real true living comes when you live not just on bread alone but also on the word of god the word of god doesn't just create the life that you have it also sustains it and the reason why that i have this thought that christians are malnourished one of my favorite preachers says all the time there's a lot of nutrition as we read the bible the nutrition of the word i just love that idea of when we're reading the word we're actually being fed we're actually being supported and lifted up by the word of God. And he says, he's come to give us abundant life. You know, real abundant life comes from the, word, from the word and not from TV and not from novels and not from raises. It comes from reading the scripture. Number seven, the word leads us to freedom. John 8, verse 11, uh, 31 and 32, to the Jews who have believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom from sin, shame, bondage, evil desires, guilt, condemnation, the lies of the enemy. We, there's so many people who come into church bound because week after week they don't read their Bible. And the Bible is meant to set you free from those things, to give you freedom. The truth sets us free. And then number eight, the word of God helps us to defeat the devil. The devil is smarter than you, and the devil is stronger than you. And yet, oftentimes, people, they, they feel like in their own strength, they can deal with him. You cannot. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was God, and the demons totally submitted to him? In fact, anytime he came anywhere near, if there was somebody who was demon-possessed, that person would just start tripping because they said, oh, there he is, there he is, it's Jesus, the Son of God. Don't look, don't look, he's going to get us. And Jesus was walking to a room, and he could actually tell demons, get out of the person. He can send them to the deepest parts of hell. And they were oftentimes very, very scared. But when Jesus dealt with the devil in the desert, what did he use? He used the scripture. Now, if he had to use the scriptures, how much more should we have to use the scriptures? To defeat the lies of the devil with the truth of God's word. In 1 John 2.14, John writes, he says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one. So for all those reasons, and that's just eight, I could go on and on and on. For those reasons, that's why we should read our Bibles. Now, what keeps us from reading our Bibles? A lot of people have a lot of different excuses as to why they might read their Bibles. I don't have time. I forgot. I don't understand it. I'm not a morning person. Um, and ultimately, you know what it comes down to when people don't read their Bible? It comes down to one simple issue, discipline. 
The, re the reason you and I struggle with reading our Bibles is because we don't have discipline. Now, you might think, oh, well, when it comes to discipline, it just means I have to make a decision one point at, and at one point in time, and then I'll be disciplined after that. How many of you guys made a New Year's resolution to say you're going to start doing something this year, and you've already stopped? Because discipline is not about this one decision. You know what discipline is? Discipline is thousands upon thousands of small decisions. Amen. That's what discipline is. If you are a disciplined person, it means that you make thousands and thousands of small decisions. You go to a birthday party, and they give you a piece of cake, a huge piece of cake, and you know that that cake has thousands of calories in it, and you say, you know what, I want to wash my weight, I want to be healthier, and so I see this cake, I know I'm not supposed to eat it, you have in that moment a chance to make a decision. Am I going to eat the cake, or am I going to leave it alone? And what do most of us do? We say, you know what, I'm going to eat the cake. Even though you know what you're, you're supposed to do. So what we do is we say, you know what, it's my boy's birthday. It's Reggie's birthday. <laughs> And so I'm going to eat this cake. But you know what? Tomorrow, it's going to be so much different. I'm going to be a different person. Now, I want you to understand, this is a lie that you and I believe. You think that because you go to sleep and wake up on a new day, you're going to be a different person than the one you were on Monday. You're going to be the exact same person. So when it comes to discipline, you and I need to... Make a decision in the moment and think this way because you think that the, the future version of you is going to make a different decision. <laughs> the me of tomorrow would push this cake away. So this is what you do. Make the decision today that the future version of you would make tomorrow. Make that decision today. The future version of me would not eat this cake. Therefore, today, I will not eat this cake. The future version of me would not neglect reading the Bible. And so today, I will not neglect reading the Bible. It's small decisions, small decisions, thousands and thousands of small decisions. People who are disciplined are not people who just grit their teeth. They're people who, in very small moments, make very small decisions. And when they make those decisions, change happens. You ever seen that show, My 600-Pound Life? It chronicles um, men and women who get to a weight of over 600 pounds, and so they have to lose all this weight. And so I was watching it the other night, and this one lady was um, dealing with, with all these weight issues and health issues because she was over 600 pounds. And so she had to get a, a surgery, the, the bypass surgery that makes your stomach smaller. And the, the doctor told her, after this surgery, you're also going to have to bring down your calories to about 1,200 calories. And so <clears throat> after the surgery, she thought, well, I'm just going to, after the surgery, I'll be great. I'll be fine. I don't have to, you know, watch what I eat. I can just, uh, when I eat it, it'll just, I'll, I'll feel full. All the cravings will be gone. And she said something I'll never forget. She's sitting there. She's eating. She has tuna and some avocado. And she's just eating it. And she's counting the calories. And she said this, I still have the cravings for that stuff that I was eating before I had my surgery. I still want the donuts. I still want the pizza. I still want all that stuff. But she said, in this moment, I have to make a decision. I'm not going to eat those things. The idea that you and I are going to live in, in our life and we're not going to face the temptation to not read our Bible, that's going to be easy. No, it's going to be difficult. As you go home today, you are going to face the same difficulty of reading your Bible on a daily basis. This life is war, and if we think it's just going to be easy, that's why we're all defeated. When it comes to reading the scriptures on a daily basis, significant change happens in the mundane. Significant change happens in the mundane. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get to that. I will get to that. In fact, I, it's, the Lord had me answer that direct question. So good. Um, so you and I, we need to be disciplined. How many of us could say, you know what? <laughs> I need to be more disciplined. 
as it relates to my reading of the word, especially all the things we said about what the word does. So, what are some, number three, what are some suggestions to help us read the Bible more? Now, I know a lot of information we just went through, so I know, and you've been in church long enough to know, you know you're supposed to have a time and a place. Right? You know, have a time, supposed to have a place, because the idea is, if you're not disciplined enough to have a time and a place, you will not do it. So, all that, you, you, you know that. So, I'm not going to really talk about that much at all. So, what are some suggestions to help us read the Bible more? Number one, get an audio Bible. Get an audio Bible. Listen to the Word of God. It's interesting, when a church got a letter from Paul... It was read to the church. They listened to it. They did not all get a copy. So it's not, it's not like they got the letter and somebody ran down to Kinko's and made a copy for the letter for everybody to look at, to take home and all that. No. They had the letter. It was read. And those people had to listen to it. And I think for us, we, we're so spoiled that we have this Bible and we can just open it and read it anytime we want. And so, but for them, it was the listening to the word of God. Now, sometimes we might think, well, it's, it's a lot better if you read it versus listening. But I read an interesting study that they had two groups um, read a 2,000 word essay. This one group read the essay and the other group listened to the essay read. And then they gave a test to see um, what they could recall. And it said that both groups both had an equal amount of recall. So the group that read and the group that listened were able to retain what they heard equally. And so the idea is, if you and I can spend time listening to the Word of God, it can be just as effective as us reading the Word of God. And why that's important is because it's easier to, ha to listen to the Word of God in certain places than to have to sit down, open your Bible, and read. For example, how many of you guys commute in the morning? Just to be able to pop into your car the Scriptures and listen to the Bible, and you can... You can be driving and be also listening to the Word of God. One of the things I do when I play Xbox, I'll sometimes turn the sound down and I'll just listen to the Scripture. And the amount of Scripture, it's amazing the things that you hear that you didn't see. I'll be listening to the Word and say, no, 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 that does not say that. There's no way it says that. And you look back, you're like, oh my goodness, it does say that. The ear gate sometimes is different than the eye gate and what it catches and what it picks up on. So you and I, we need to grab, we need to have an audio Bible. So where do you get this? Again, we live in an in a age where you and I can do it. Three places that you can go. One, if you have an iPhone or you have an iPad, or I'm sure it's on because I don't like Androids and all that stuff, but if you have one of those phones, I'm sure you can get an app called a version. version app is the Bible, and, and on some of the Bibles, you can actually listen to the Scripture. Okay, there's another app called Bible.is. It's another free um, listening app, and you can get um, different translations in different, uh, even there's things like 850 languages that they read the Bible in. And you can get your translation, and you can listen to the Scripture on your iPad, on your iPhone. There's another um, group of CDs that I got read by a guy named uh, Max McLean. He's like an uh, actor sort of person, and he read through um, the Bible, and it's called the Listener's Bible. And I looked last night on Amazon. To get that set of CDs, it costs eighty dollars, eighty bucks. Now, that's a great investment um, to spend eighty dollars to hear the Word of God rather than to spend it on a video game or something else. So, those I would commend those to you: the U version, Bible Bible.is, the Listener's Bible. That all those things um, to listen to the Word of God enables you to be able to multitask and do different things and listen to huge chunks of the Bible at once. Number two. Suggestion, read whole books of the Bible. Amen. Um, we've become very used to reading the Bible in terms of chapter and verse. But understand the Bible was not given to us in that way. That it was written, we added the chapters and verses later in order to help with reference. So if we want to know where is this, we can find it easily. But the way we're supposed to read the, 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 the Bible is in these huge chunks because... I think we oftentimes miss the blessing of reading the Word of God when we 
sort of divide it up into pieces the way it is because the the people who got the word of god they got it as a letter and they would read the entire letter they wouldn't just read it in little bits and pieces so sometimes we have our little devotional right we we open up the bible it says the lord is my light and my salvation we say oh lord thank you for your word and we walk away and not saying that's bad that's you know better than nothing but at the same time like there's there's so much more that he said you ever been reading the bible like in romans and you come up, up uh, to a verse that's in the romans road you're like what that's where that's from because you're so used to just pulling it out of its context that you're not used to seeing it in what Paul was saying. Paul, he was writing letters. These are stories. These are ideas. These are songs. So just pulling them out of the context sometimes makes us not see all that is there. When you and I write a, 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 an email, we don't say verse 1, hello. Verse 2, you owe me money. Verse 3, like we don't do that because we know a letter has flow. It has thought. It has an argument. So read whole books of the Bible. So sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we're, so, we're trying so hard, and this is another thing, we're trying so hard to get and understand everything that we're reading. And I'll never forget, somebody said this to me years ago. He said, when I read the Word of God, I'm not going to get everything. I'm not going to understand everything. But when I go to, this is me talking, when I go to BJ's and I get a clam chowder, and I eat it, I don't know all the, the processes that are taking place for, in order for that food to give me the nutrition I need. I don't know where the protein and the fat and all the, the chemicals and all that. I just eat it. And I let the food do, the, do its work. And he said, sometimes when you read the Bible, you just need to read it. You don't need to try and understand every little thing because the Word of God will do its work in your life. And so sometimes it might be, look, I'm reading like Gail, I'm reading, and I'm reading the same paragraph over and over and over. Move on. Just go to the next, to the next paragraph. Move on and read it and read it and read it. And sometimes, again, the word meditate in Psalms, it means to mutter. That's what the word meditate means. So it means sort of like to say and repeat over and over. So the idea of meditation is um. The idea of meditation is to saying something underneath your breath. So over and over and over, saying something, saying something. So if I said you, what, what's your phone number? 762-6112, 762-6112. That's meditation. That's the idea of meditation, muttering, saying over and over. So sometimes it's good to go over and over a passage. Now sometimes it's where we are, the time we do it, the things that are going in on our mind, and sometimes we need to pray because nobody in this room is is um exempt from being distracted <laughs> i read the bible and teach the bible for a living and every single day i try and read my bible i'm thinking about drama team oh that would be a funny line sorry lord <laughs> i'm reading my bible i was reading the other day like yes he has believed our message to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a, why did Kaepernick throw that pass? <laughs> it's first down. We got four of the plays. Sorry, Lord. Sorry, sorry, sorry. These people on Love and Hip Hop are stupid. I don't... Happens to all of us. And listen, the Lord's not up there like, oh, this guy. <laughs> he can't even read my word for five minutes without getting distracted. God is not up there saying, you better read it with no distractions. You better read it and understand everything you read and preach it. when you." He says, look, 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 just, just, this is another thing. The Bible, when you sit down and read a letter, it's a letter. It's God speaking to you. So you say, okay, I don't need to stress over this. God, you're trying to talk to me. And sometimes, just go to a part you do understand. I'm being serious. If you... If you don't get what you're reading, especially you're reading through Leviticus, Lord have mercy. <laughs> like this, this, and I'm like, man, I'm going somewhere else. And remember, all scripture is profitable. So for, I don't know how, but Leviticus is somehow important to us as, <laughs> as believers. So, so just, just relax. Remember, um, Jesus was on the cross dying for our inconsistent Bible reading. Seriously. If you beat yourself up about this, you're forgetting the cross. You're forgetting the gospel. 
And there's always the next day. There's always another opportunity to read God's word. And you got you got 365 days to do it. Amen. But when you're trying to read it, trying to read whole books, they have um, Bibles out now called um, reader Bibles where they actually take the chapters and verses out. So now when you read the Bible, you're not distracted by, okay, this is chapter 2. Chapter, you're just kind of reading it, and sometimes you just get lost. Amen. You look at it, you realize, man, I read five chapters, because that's the way it's supposed to be. So one's called the ESV Reader Bible. I'm not sure the other ones, but you can find them. that They take out the chapters, and that might help you instead of being distracted by those things. So, and then thirdly, lastly, choose a method and stick with it. I read one pastor who read 15 chapters a day. He would read five in the morning, he would do five after dinner, and he would read five before he went to bed. At that pace, he would read the Bible around four times a year. Now, I want to ask you this question. How many of you guys, you have 15 minutes a day? You have at least 15 minutes a day. At least. Okay. At least 15 minutes a day. Now, the average person reads 300 words per minute. Average. Now, some people read more, some people read less, but the average person reads 300 words per minute. In the Bible, there are 774,746 words. So if you were to read for 15 minutes a day at 300 words per minute, you would be able to get through the entire Bible in 172 days, which is roughly half a year, which means if you read for 15 minutes a day for the entire year, Potentially, you can get through the entire Bible twice, 15 minutes a day. And the question is, like I said, do you have 15 minutes a day to read God's Word? Now, I know part of our private worship is not just Bible reading. It's prayer, singing, and all sorts of other things. But at least 15 minutes, and we can read through God's Word daily. And that's my hope. You would read through it daily, and that you would remember it's for your, our joy. It's for our life as believers. So, let's pray.